by saying happy Father's Day to uh, all the dads who are here and who are uh, watching online. I hope that for at least uh, one day out of the year, everybody's nice to you and uh, lets you eat, you know, your favorite foods and watch your favorite movies or U.S. Open or whatever it is that you're planning on doing today and hope you have a wonderful day. Uh, as Austin said, we have a gift for uh, all the dads, so make sure you pick that up uh, before you leave today, so at least we know you'll get something, even if your kids kind of let you down. We're going to do our best to take care of you. Hey, if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to Daniel chapter 2, and uh, while you're finding it, I have a question I want you to think about. It. As you look back over your career, have you ever had an unreasonable boss who put you in an impossible situation? Now, as soon as I said that, some of you had the face of, of someone that you've spent years trying to forget, like flash into your memory. Maybe you can feel your anxiety rising uh, as you think about it. They're the person that, uh, that always sort of, you know, dumped the jobs on you that nobody else wanted because they knew you'd do it. Or maybe they're the person who was always asking you to stay late so that they could leave early or uh, taking the credit for what you did and, you know, passing the blame for what they did. Or maybe they just routinely asked you to do things that proved impossible to do. They wanted you to balance numbers that didn't add up and sell products that nobody was interested in and close deals that nobody wanted to close. And uh, you, you know how it works. You've probably been in that situation at some point in your life. And if you have, then you can relate to what Daniel was facing in Daniel chapter 2. So last week, if you were here, we kicked off this series that we're calling Thriving in Babylon, in which we're working through the, the Old Testament story of Daniel. And just to recap where we've been, the story of Daniel begins when a group of people called the Babylonians, led by a ruthless king named Nebuchadnezzar, overpowers and conquers what's called the kingdom of Judah, which included the city of Jerusalem, where Daniel and his family were from. Now, as a part of their hostile takeover, uh, they not only destroyed the city of Jerusalem, they also leveled the temple, which was kind of like the, the centerpiece of Jewish life. It's hard to compare it to something in our culture because we don't have anything. Even the White House or the Capitol wouldn't compare to what the temple meant to Jewish people. The other thing they did is they kidnapped some of the, the best and brightest citizens of Judah they relocated them 900 miles to Babylon, and they enrolled them in school with the hopes of, of transforming them into good Babylonians so that they could then use their gifts to build and expand their empire in the future. And Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are a part of that group. In Daniel chapter 1, we read how at the end of three years of being educated in the Royal Academy of Babylon. By the end of that three years, Daniel had risen to the top of his class, and he had already become a trusted advisor to the king. Daniel 1, verse 20, says it like this. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them, talking about Daniel and his friends, ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. Now, keep in mind, historians tell us that Daniel was around 15 years old when Babylon conquered Judah. So you add the three years he was in school, he's now uh, 18 or 19 years old, and he's already established himself as a valuable member of King Nebuchadnezzar's administration. Now, whatever you do, don't skip over that. Now, you would think, like, on the surface of it, you would think, here's this guy, he's from a conquered nation, Nebuchadnezzar is the guy you know, who upended his life, he destroyed the city he grew up in, he leveled the temple that he'd grown up worshiping in, he probably murdered most of his family and friends, and you would think there would be a part of Daniel that if he could get in would try to undermine this person who's upended his life and sort of take his revenge. Like he can't attack him head on, but, but maybe he can sort of gum up the works and, and make things harder than they need to be for Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, you would think that if Daniel was anything like a normal person, like most of us, he would have his heart set on getting revenge on the guy who'd messed up his life so dramatically. And yet, rather than sort of raging against the machine, 
Daniel becomes a valuable member of Nebuchadnezzar's administration. Now, why would he, why would he do that? Last week, and we talked about the fact that while the changes that, that we've lived through uh, might not be quite as dramatic as what Daniel ha- went through, and they certainly didn't happen as quickly as what Daniel faced, there is a sense in which a lot of us, if you're a certain age, it feels now as if you're living in a world that's a lot different than the world you grew up in, right? It just, it feels different. Uh, the way we communicate is different. Our, our, our values are different. It just feels like we're in a world that we don't recognize. And as you read through history, this is not the first time that's happened. This is something that happens over and over again, almost on a cyclical scale. And historically speaking, there are four primary ways that Christians have responded to the culture around them. Now, we talked about this just a few weeks ago, so I'm not going to belabor the point, but I, I did want to remind you of something because I think it's a good example of what Daniel does. So the, the first way that some Christians have responded to the world around them is the path of separation. They've tried to just sort of pull back, uh, separate themselves from everybody around them. It's like they create this bubble, and they're careful not to let anybody else in. The second path, and the one that seems to be growing in popularity today, is the path of assimilation. And so rather than trying to separate myself, I'm just going to become like the people around me. It's the whole idea, you know, if you can't beat them, join them. And so rather than maintaining your distinctiveness, you just sort of morph into what everybody else is doing. The next one, which is also growing in popularity, is the idea of confrontation. Like me, uh, some of you grew up in the era of the culture wars and everything was good versus evil and it's us versus them and the problem with that approach is that the people that you think are your enemy rather than being enemy rather than being people to be one to christ you view them as enemies uh, to be defeated and then the last one which is the more biblical option and the one that daniel chose is this idea of transformation so rather than than retreating from the culture rather than becoming like the people around him And rather than going to war with Nebuchadnezzar and all the Babylonians, Daniel decided to use his unique gifts in the position where God had placed him to transform the culture around him. So if you're tracking with us, here's the big idea for the message today that you're going to see demonstrated in Daniel chapter 2. It's that our calling as followers of God is to work to transform our communities into what God created them to be. And if you're wondering where Daniel got that idea, he got it from God. Uh, and Jer- if you read through the Old Testament, you eventually come to this book called Jeremiah. It's really long. It's really hard to understand. But if you want to make sense of the book of Jeremiah, you have to remember, it's part of, the, it's part of what the Old Testament calls the exilic literature, which means, it's a fancy phrase, which means it was written during the time of the Babylonian exile. So Jeremiah was like the the primary preacher or the primary prophet to the people like Daniel who had been removed from Judah and now found themselves living in Babylon, a world that was unlike anything they had encountered before and anything they remembered. So if you want to know what God was saying to Daniel and other people like him during the time they were sort of trapped in Babylon... You have to go back and you read Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah 29, everybody knows like Jeremiah 29 and 11, right? That's the one you've got on the, the plaques from Home Depot or uh, uh, whatever the place is in Somerset. You, you know, the, but, but what happens before that is that Jeremiah writes this letter to all the people living in Babylon directly from God. And he says, here's what I want you to do while you're living in Babylon. If you, have your, or if you have your outline, it's, it's printed there for you. Jeremiah 29, verse 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters increase in number there do not decrease also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which i've carried you into exile pray to the lord for it because if it prospers you too will prosper once you pay special attention to highlight a part verse 7 where it says seek the peace and prosperity 
of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Did you know that if you're a follower of God, part of your calling is to make the place where you find yourself better? Did you know that? Like when you get up and go to work, like you're not just there to earn a paycheck. When you go to school, you're not just there, you know, to do whatever it is you have to do. Part of your job is to make every environment in which you find yourself better. You're to tra help transform it into what God created it to be. So wherever you find yourself, you transform your community, your classroom, your company, your team, your board, your church, your small group, your neighborhood association. I mean, every part of your life, your job as a follower of Jesus is to do everything you can to make things better. Another way to say it, part of our calling as a church is to help make Monticello, Kentucky, a better place to live. Now, a lot of times we don't think about it in those terms, but that's what Daniel, that's what Daniel was told from God, and so that's what Daniel tried to do. So again, make sure you get this. When you get up and go to work, your role is not to just go there and do enough to get by and, you know, eventually retire so that you can sit at home and watch reruns until the day your family plans your funeral. That's not it. Your calling is to help build whatever kind of business you're involved in is to build it into something that honors God and helps people. You're a teacher. Your job is not just to improve test scores and secure funding. Your job is to help students build better lives so that they can become the people that God created them to be. If you're, if you're in a political position, your job is not to serve a political party or line your own pockets. Your job is to make your community a better place to live. That's what Jeremiah said to the, the Babylon exile. says, here's what God wants you to do. He wants you to put down your roots, settle in, and make the place around you a better place to live. And so that's what Daniel did. He, he, even though he was forced to live in a culture that was opposed to nearly everything he believed in, rather than working to undermine his handlers, he instead put down his roots and did what he could to make things better. And in Daniel chapter 2, you see a dramatic example of this. So Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, this ruthless king, has had a dream that has spooked him so much that he wants to know what he's to make of. So he calls in all of his advisors, all of his uh, magicians and enchanters and sorcerers, and he says, here's the deal. I've had this dream, and I want you to interpret the dream and tell me what it means. But before you interpret the dream, I want you to tell me what the dream was. So think about it. Here, here's the situation. I want you to come in, and you've got to tell me what the dream was. You've got to describe the dream to me. And then you have to tell me what it means, and I'm not going to give you any clues. Like, no pressure, right? And then he says, if you don't do it, here's what's going to happen to you. Daniel 2, verse 5. The king replied to the astrologers, this is what I firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. So on one hand, hey, you do this, get a fat raise, get a promotion. It's going to be awesome. But if you don't, I'm going to cut you up into pieces and bulldoze your house and probably kill all your family. So do the best you can. And that's where the word. Now, if you know the rest of the story, you know that's, that's an impossible situation, right? Nebuchadnezzar is an unreasonable boss who's put his, his servants in this unreasonable, impossible situation. And if you read through the rest of the chapter, nobody can do this. It's one failed attempt after another until finally at verse 12, you get to verse 12, Nebuchadnezzar is so angry that nobody's going to do this that he decides to make good on his threat to kill everybody. So verse 12 says, This made the king so angry and so furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. So it looks like, hey, this thing's over, right? Daniel's story, as dramatic as it began, is going to come to this tragic end 
and he's going to be eliminated along with all the king's other advisors. Last weekend, if you were here, we looked at Babylon's strategy for capturing the hearts of the people living in that empire. Today, we're going to take a different approach, and we're going to look at Daniel's strategy for influencing the empire of Babylon. So we're going to kind of reverse it. And it's interesting, Daniel realized that he had been called by God through what Jeremiah did to make things better. Even as hard as that seemed like it was going to be, as impossible as it it looked like it was going to be, he thought, I've got to do something. So there are three things he does. And just so you know, they're the same three things we have to do if we want to improve our community. And if, if you're a father or a grandfather, these are the same things that you need to do if you want to influence your kids and your grandkids in a better direction. So if you're tracking with us, here's the first thing. Daniel adopted the position of a servant. You get down to verse 14, and here's what it says. Um, If I can find it. Yeah, when Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king... And I asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then verse 19 is going to come into play later. It says, during the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. So you got to imagine this scene. The king has issued this decree. Everybody's going to be executed. The king's servant shows up, and Daniel says, hey, uh, don't do this yet. And so Daniel sort of, and not just pleading for his own life and the life of his friends, he sort of adopts the role of a servant, and he's trying to help the other people that the king is also going to execute. So, so keep in mind, Daniel is now trying to help his coworkers who may not even like him. If you think about it, it only makes sense. Here are these guys, these other enchanters, these other sorcerers, these other advisors who have spent their life trying to climb the ladder in Babylon. And then this Jewish guy from Judea shows up, and all of a sudden, he surpasses all of them. You know, there, there had to be some resentment on their end. I mean, there had, to be, there had to be this sense of, I can't believe this guy has passed us up. And so Daniel works in this environment in which most of the people he works with probably don't like him. And they certainly don't like what he represents. And some of you have been in environments like that. Some of you have worked in places where, where you had to be careful what you said to whoever because you didn't know who they were going to repeat it to. Some of you know what it's like to have coworkers that are out to get you. And yet Daniel's in this environment where everybody's against him, and yet he puts himself on the line to help people that don't like him. Now, let me just stop there and ask you a second. When's the last time you put yourself on the line to help people who might not even like you? How about this? When's the last time... You, you, you put yourself on the line to help your boss, whom you may not even like, and who truthfully may not even like you. When's the last time you did something like that? See, if you go back to verse 16, one of the reasons that Daniel was able to get an audience with the king, it says he went in to see the king, one of the reasons he was able to get in there is because at some level he had earned the respect of the king. If you remember before, it said Nebuchadnezzar already knew that Daniel was at least 10 times better than all of his advisors. And so when Daniel said, I'd like to have an audience with the king, the king knew it's in my best interest to listen to what this guy has to say. And this is a good time to ask yourself, does the person I work for and the people I work with know that when I tell them something, they should listen. Do they know that I'm here to serve them? And even though you, and do the people that you work with, I mean, do they know that you've got their back and you're there to serve? Even though you might not agree on everything, even though you might view the world from wildly different perspectives, do they know they can count on you? What about this? If you're a father 
do the people that live at your house, that live with you and look up to you, do they know that when you speak, they should listen? Do they know that you've got their back and you're going to do everything you can to help them become the people that God created them to be? And the reason that's so important is because of what comes next. So first, Daniel adopts the position of a servant. And then Daniel fills the role of a truth teller. Now, before we look at this, I want to give you one, um, just one caution, one sort of uh, disclaimer that's super important to remember. Now, in our culture, we all know people, and I bet you have people in your family uh, who, who they just sort of live to drop, you know, truth bombs on the unsuspecting heads of their coworkers and their neighbors and their family. I mean, you'll be talking about something else, and they'll come out just like spitting fire. You, you know who I'm talking about. And they kind of take the attitude, hey, I'm going to tell it like it is, and if they don't like it, that's on them. And, and I get all that. We, we need, sometimes we need people like that. We need people who are willing to say hard things and unpopular things and not just go along with what the majority is saying. But can I just tell you, if that's the approach you take, and you just love to drop truth bombs on people, if you don't ever establish a relationship with those people in which they know you're for them, they're not going to listen to anything you have to say. Make sure you understand that. And so Daniel gains this audience with the king, and he buys himself some time, and then when he comes back, he has to tell the king something that the king doesn't want to hear. Now remember, he's been there for three years now. He's earned the, the right to say these things because Nebuchadnezzar knows that during his time in Babylon, Daniel has worked for the peace and the prosperity of the kingdom. And so when Daniel comes in to deliver a message, the king is all ears. Check this out, verse 26. Uh, the king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel replied, No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about us, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you were lying in bed are these. As your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come, and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so that your majesty may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. Your majesty looked, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on the threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. So that, that's kind of the first part of the assignment, right? Daniel gets what he has to do. So God has revealed the dream. And so he says, here's what you saw in your dream. I've got an artist's rendering of what this statue that Nebuchadnezzar might have looked like. And it's, it's, it's no wonder like he was spooked, right? You look at that, you think, man, that, that, that's kind of hard to explain. You got the gold head and the silver chest and the bronze belly and the legs of iron. But then it's got, it's got these feet of clay. And then you get to verse uh, 36. And Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar, what in the world all this means. Verse 36. This was the dream, and now we will interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands, he has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the sky. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are that head of gold. After you. 
another kingdom will arise inferior to yours next a third kingdom one of bronze will rule over the whole earth finally there will be a fourth kingdom strong as iron for iron breaks and smashes everything and as iron breaks things to pieces so it will crush and break all the others just as you saw that the feet of toe and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron so this too will be a divided kingdom yet it will have some some of the strength of iron in it even as you saw iron mixed with clay as the toes were partly iron and partly clay so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle and just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. Now, if you're a person who's really into Old Testament prophecy, you know this is one of those passages that students of prophecy love to obsess over and talk about what exactly all this means. And personally, I think the, uh, the, the best answer is probably the simplest answer. So I'm going to put this on a slide just so you can see. E each part of this statue represents a different world empire that dominated that part of the world from about 600 years before Christ until 400 years after the birth of Christ. So it's kind of this thousand-year picture of world history. Uh, the gold represents the Babylonian Empire led by Nebuchadnezzar. He's like the head. In fact, if you go back at what Daniel said, he even refers to him as the king of kings. Then you have the silver chest area, which is the Medo-Persian Empire, which just a few years after this dream was going to overtake Babylon, led by a guy named Darius, who's going to play a big role in the second half of Daniel. Then you get down to the bronze belly. That's the Greek Empire led by Alexander the Great. Then you get to those iron legs. And of course, you know, it's the Roman Empire that was around uh, when Jesus was born. That's sort of the world that he was born into. And those iron legs represent their strength. And if you know your world history, you know Rome had a way of going around and just crushing all the opposition. And so this statue is kind of this unfolding picture of what's going to happen to the world over the next thousand years or so and looking back it's, it's an incredibly accurate vision of how all this was going to play out but whatever you do whatever you think about the prophecy angle don't miss what's happening here here's daniel this this refugee this prisoner of war from a conquered nation he's standing before the most powerful man on the earth at that time and he says to him, even though Nebuchadnezzar holds Daniel's life in his hands, and he says to him, hey, as impressive as your kingdom is right now, as powerful as you are, as glorious as all this looks, it's soon going to come to an end. And the reason Nebuchadnezzar listened to that is because he knew Daniel had his best interest at heart. If anybody but Daniel had come in and said something like that. I mean, this is a hard truth spoken to a powerful man, but Daniel delivers it flawlessly. Because he had adopted the role of a servant, he had earned the right to be a truth teller, even when the truth he had to share was incredibly hard to hear. And then you get to this last part. So you adopt the position of a servant, you fill the role of a truth teller, and then finally you use your position to relentlessly point people to Jesus. So I want you to look at verse 44. Daniel comes to the end of this dream. That's one of the coolest descriptions in the Old Testament. I want you to listen to what he says is going to happen. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown you, the king, what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. If you could somehow go back in time, you could visit any of those world empires at almost any moment, it would have looked as if they were firmly in control of the world around them. But as impressive as they were, they proved to be temporary. That's what those feet of clay always represent. As impressive as they are, 
they're not permanent. And just so you know, the empire that you spent your life building is also temporary. Like that IRA that you spent your life funding is one day going to be empty. And that house that you're so proud of now is one day going to fall in or it's going to be sold to somebody that's never heard your name. And that land that you keep amassing is one day going to be auctioned off by your kids and grandkids. I mean, that's just how it works. All of us have feet of clay. Every empire eventually crumbles, and every king is eventually dethroned. That's what happened to these guys. It's what happens now, and it's what's eventually going to happen to us. There is no way around it. And so if you want to build your life on something, you have to build your life on the rock that crushes all other kingdoms and reduces them to piles of rubble. And so Daniel stands before the most powerful man in the world. And he says, I know you think this is what it's all about. I know you think you've got this all figured out. I know you think you've built this, this, you know, this, this secure life. But you need to know that there is a rock that will crush you to pieces if you don't follow God's direction. And then you get to verse 46, and I want you to look at how Nebuchadnezzar responds. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of of kings and revealer of mysteries for you were able to reveal this mystery then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him he made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all of its wise men moreover at Daniel's request the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon while Daniel himself remained at the royal court I told you earlier, 15 years old when Daniel was relocated from Judah to Babylon. He's been in school three years, so he's now 18 or 19 years old. And now, all of a sudden, he is the governor of the most powerful empire on the planet. Here's this guy that started out with no influence, with no backing, and now all of a sudden, he's in a position where instead of Babylon influencing him, he's going to influence Babylon. It's an incredible story of what can happen when you choose to live your life God's way. He'll take you no matter where you are, and he can elevate you to a place where you can influence the people around you and not just have the people around you influence you. I've got a picture I want to show you. Uh, this is uh, Nick Mengio, and some of you uh, watched the game yesterday, incredible game. University of Kentucky made the College World Series for the first time, played their first game yesterday, had a walk-off win in the 10th inning against North Carolina State. It, it was really awesome. Uh, so you may not be a baseball fan, but, but this guy's been on the news a lot the last uh, couple weeks, given dozens of interviews, uh, been in all kinds of sports magazines, and even in the paper um, and in, the, in part of these interviews, he talked about some of the transitions that have taken place in his life over the last few years. And he talked about in the, the 2022 season, Kentucky was one game short of making the College World Series. It was the, it was the closest they've ever been. They lost the last game in heartbreaking fashion and didn't get to go. And that sort of sent Coach, by his own admission, into this tailspin. He spent months sort of reflecting on how he coached and why he coached and some of the changes that he needed to make. And, and then he talked about, in a recent interview, he met with a uh, former UK coach and Wilmore native, all good things come from Wilmore, uh, Keith, Keith Madison. Keith Madison coached for 25 years at Kentucky. And they, they started doing this Bible study together and even meet weekly with the former coach. And he said it was during one of those Bible studies after this, this terrible loss that he came to this conclusion that he needed to change his approach. And, and here's the quote that he said in the, in the paper. He said, God taught me a lesson. It's not what you're playing for, it's who you're playing for. 
And I got done chasing this dream of Omaha, which is where the World Series, and I just said, I'm done. I'm not chasing that anymore. Lord, I want to play for you. It's not what you're playing for. It's who you're playing for, and that's what God taught me. The Lord put it on my heart that I was not using my spiritual gifts that he had given me, and we had to make changes. Now, if you watch any of the, the dozens of interviews over the last few weeks, Mingione has said time and time again, he said, this has been the best two weeks of my life. And all the sports writers assume he's talking about the way his team is playing. But when he's been given an opportunity, he's pointed out that it all started two weeks ago when his son, uh, Reeves, was baptized at his house. Been talking about baptism forever. And he said that, that's way more important than um, any of the baseball games. In fact, there's a video floating around. You may have seen it on social media in which they, they baptized his son, Reeves, and the entire uh, UK baseball team is there to watch. Now, some of the national writers were upset about that. They said it's really, you know, bad that a, a, all the, you know, players on a public university went to a kid's bath. Listen, if that's what you're upset about, you need to get a life. You know what I mean? Like, if that's what you're really griping about. And so he said over and over again, this something that's more important than winning baseball games or winning championships. And you get to the point, you get to the end of the season, all of a sudden, they got a chance to win some baseball games and win a championship. And it's almost as if, like, the moment you surrender all of that and you decide you're going to do whatever you can to use your gifts in the place God has placed you to make things better, God has a way of elevating you to a place where you can have a greater influence on the people around you. But it's not so that you can build your own kingdom. It's not so you can start your own empire. It's so that you can help expand God's kingdom. And when you do that, things have a way of falling into place. I want you to stand uh, with me. I want to challenge you this morning to commit to using your gifts to, to expand God's kingdom and use the, the gifts you have where God has placed you to point other people to Jesus. If you've not been doing that, now is a good time to start. Uh, if you've not made the primary decision to put your life in his hands, uh, we'd love to help you do that. I'm here, David's here, uh, John's here. We'd love to pray with you if you're ready to make a public decision or pray with someone. Uh, we'd be glad to pray with you. All you need to do is leave your seat during this next song and meet me down front.